subject in my opinion, not just the bones, the skulls, the double rows of teeth, even the horn skulls in fact, that we find all over North America, which I've written extensively about, uh, actual giants, but also the ancient myths of these giants are very profound. They go into great detail in the Old Testament, in the Sumerian writings, talking about the watches, the Anunnaki, and so forth. And also all around the world we find these legends, and sometimes the foundation myths of countries are based upon giants being defeated by the incoming rulers. Like in England, for instance, we have uh, the great giant Gog Magog who lived in Cornwall on the South Devon coast in the general area. And he was defeated by the Trojan Brutus and his team. They threw him off the cliff and then took over in Britain. And these are all ancient traditions. But if you go to the areas where these happen, giant bones have actually been found. There's actually evidence now of a Trojan connection to ancient Britain in the Welsh animals. So this is one example from my home country where this is the case. And we get this, obviously, we're going to talk about this throughout the, the early biblical traditions. But even in North America, the oral traditions here uh, state that there were giants in the ancient past, even going back to the time of the megafauna, before the time even of the younger tribes, so 13,000 years ago. So it's just a, a brief thing there, but there's so much more. Right, yeah, thank you. Um, and particularly from the ancient astronaut perspective, William, um, uh, something that people have paid a lot of attention to, you know, from the work of Zach Ryan Sitchin is the Anunnaki. So if you could talk a little bit about um, who they were and, and what we now believe they could have been. Yeah, so the Anunnaki, uh, in Simpson's interpretation, is those who came to Earth from Heaven. They definitely have this stellar connection. Um, and one of the aspects that uh, Sitchin overlooked that recently academics have been starting to do, discuss uh, in their journals is the concept of the, the of the Anunnaki as being the mighty ones. The, there's, there's two schools we're talking about the giants. One is that they're very tall, which I believe they are. There's definitely story after story and, and uh, other physical evidence that suggests they have great height. But then the other school of thought is that they were called the mighty ones because they possessed a transmittable cloak or garment. Uh, the, the Sumerian term is Malamu. And this is the one that the academics are discussing. They're pulling out of the Sumerian community form tablets now and discussing this word malamu, and what it means is radiance, great power, and uh, especially luminosity. This was the quality of the Anunnaki. And here's the thing about the malamu, is that it was uh, symbolized as a garment, and it might have been a literal physical garment that the Anunnaki wore, but the key thing is, is that it was transmittable. A human could acquire from the Anunnaki the Malamu garment and themselves become a mighty one, a giant among men. So they you kind of think of, you start thinking of Superman's cloak, you start thinking of Wonder Woman, you start thinking of all of these mythological stories that now involve humans taking on these types of superpowers. And this is, uh, from the Malamu perspective, one of the reasons why the Anunnaki came here was to bequeath to humanity the powers of the gods. One person uh, who had this Malamu was Nimrod, and he's considered to be a giant. So here's the tie-in, where you've got these very tall people that also possess this transmittable cloak or garment to Malamu that gave them mighty powers or made them mighty men. And uh, a tie-in with it, which we can come back to, is this idea of why would you want one of these mighty garments? Why would you want to become a, 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 a radiant or a luminous being? And the tie-in with the story after story of this Malamu garment is the idea of putting on this garment in preparation for going through a portal or a gateway following the Anunnaki into the realm in which they originated. I'm thinking of Goliath. Uh, David Goliath, a familiar story here is this uh, towering figure that we can read about in the Bible. We could uh, look for the bones, and there could well be bones. I'm thinking symbolically, part of what we're dealing with is a, a kind of uh, respect for the past. The great things happened in distant memory, loss, perhaps hidden, but we have powers that were once available to us. Perhaps we were giants once, or perhaps we can have their magic if we are diligent and search for it. Uh, also, a new religion, a new tradition, has to deal with the power and authority of the past which tends to loom large. Once it is dead, once it has fallen down, it is not fearful anymore. There are also stories, and you might be able to correct
correct me in terms of in Ireland, uh, one thing I read was that the Lebra families are small. They have this, this, these various sizes. Why are mysterious creatures different sizes? And one legend is that the Lebra were once giants. I don't know the details of why they might have gotten small, but again, we have competing uh, traditions that the old things that are no longer in charge will sometimes be seen as small and lurking in the bushes somewhere, and the previous things that were before our time are imagined being enormous. I saw that, Jonathan, that the, they were, the leprechauns were part of the fair folk, yeah. and then the Catholic Church put the, the Y on the end to make them more diminutive or lesser in stature, so they became the fairies. Everybody thinks of them as like a Disney-style fairy, but in reality, they were originally the tall, uh, fair ones, the Anunnaki. And the, the legend has it that if you, if you want to see the fairies, go out in the moonlight or follow a cave that goes down through the roots of a tree. Now we're talking about hollow earth stuff because we get down into the underworld where, of course, they're still hiding, waiting for their moment to come back. Although you have to be careful with time because if you follow a fairy down into their world and come back, a hundred years may pass because they don't live in the same clock time we do. Interesting, and I think even in Greek, uh, mythology with large creatures do. I think like, like Cyclops are sometimes very large. Right. And, 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 and the gods before the Olympians, the Titans, were said to have been towering. Interesting. Yeah. So we go further, further back, the larger the gods become. Yeah, I mean, with, with the Titans of ancient Greece, you mentioned the Cyclops. These were an offshoot of the Titans. Uh, the whole uh, the great Titans were actually defeated, as you said, by the Olympians, they say. <laughs> Uh, but some of them apparently survived. These were the Cyclops. These were the offshoot. These were master stone masons. These were master metallurgists. And they held the secrets and spread and diffused the secrets around the world of their original masters, the Titans. And we have Kronos, who was the king of the Titans, uh, and other such things. And their stories and their legends go all around Europe, all around through Greece, through Italy, even into Sardinia and other places suggesting that indeed they were real people and they were responsible for many of these great megalithic remains. Especially they were renowned, they just seemed to love building megalithic walls around the world. Um, and these are, these are clearly evident, as you probably saw in the previous panel, in Italy and other areas of the Mediterranean. And I believe that there's a strong connection and I believe that these people were real, that they were actual giants who were employed through the hard labor. Um, I'm not saying the whole world was giants, but they were there, and there, there is a physical you know, manifestation of this phenomenon, as well as legendary, when we look back to, like you said, the time of the mighty gap. And they were in the southwest, too. I remember going back to, uh, just after 9-11, there was a big UFO conference out in, uh, in Arizona that I attended. I met a gentleman out there, and he had these photos. Of, they were black and white of 12 and 15 foot skeletons. He said they had long red hair, long blonde hair, and he had been researching them for over a decade. He was with a, a, a Native American friend of his that came from southern Utah. This is Greg Nielsen. This is Greg Nielsen. Yes, I didn't want to say his name, but it's Greg. It is, yeah. And so I lost, <laughs> so I lost touch with Greg uh, for a number of years, and then a friend of mine built a, a, a home outside Phoenix, and they were having a house blessing, and it walks Greg with his Native American friend, Three Eagles, who's from southern Utah. He said, Crap, man, where have you been? Those photos you were showing me were mind-blowing. And uh, he said, well, you know, he had spent a long time seeking out these, these uh, sites, these caves where you would have these, these grave sites, where you would have these 12 and 15 foot uh, beings that are laid out on these crystalline slabs that would be gold all around them. And Greg said they fi he finally found it to be too dangerous to, to continue his search because he found that he was really just bird dogging for the government. And as soon as they would find the site, here come the black helicopters. But he said it wasn't the government that they were really afraid of, it was the black market guys. The government would just shut you down, the black market people would try to kill you to take whatever you were finding in these sites. But Three Eagles talked about growing up in southern Utah in these kind of poverty stricken areas, rural areas and that they would kick over all the time these grave sites of the giants out in the southwest and that ultimately the government would come in and they would uh, create all these fake communities on top of these grave sites to, uh, to conceal what was actually going on. 
And so it was absolutely astonishing to, to see what is really the, the reality in ancient America. It's all centered on uh, the existence of these giants. I saw the I saw the video of his lecture. I never got to meet him. But I think he passed away there. Actually. And uh, he is um, what, one of the things he did. You've all forgotten his name now. That's, that's good. <laughs> and uh, and uh, well, one of the things that captured my attention. I did have some communication with him in some emails. Is that they were these burials were in solid rock. These were solid rock burials drilled down about the size of like a three feet wide, maybe four feet wide, straight down like a tubular drill, four feet wide, going down into the box. And there were two of these going down. One... So there were two, there was like one tunnel going down, one, and then across the bottom they would join up. This is where the burial was. And then they would put like a, a plug, a stone plug on it, and put stuff over it so you could never see it. It was so perfectly cut. So they had some kind of advanced technology just to create their burials. And I know Greg, Sorry, the, 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 the man we don't know, uh, the man we don't know, he, you know, he was, he, he found a bunch of these, and it was, it was unbelievable, and he was blown away just by the technology, let alone what he found within them. So, so the fact that, you know, we have individuals, you know, dedicating themselves for decades researching this is just, it's just amazing, and I think, you know, it, this is the tip of the iceberg in North America, trust me. Yeah. Small detail, but the, the hair may have been red or it may have been caused by the water that seeped through the stone chemicals in the hands. Well, yeah, and, and the other thing about, you know, in America, and red hair, and why are they red hair, uh, is the, Love Lock, the story of the Lovelock Caves, which is very fascinating, and um, I know QU researched that quite a bit in terms of not only uh, the story of uh, giant creatures, but also the bones that were supposedly recovered, some of the other artifacts that suggested these were large beings. Yeah, anyone here been to Lovelock Cave in Nevada? Me. <laughs> so this is a this is a remarkable site. I'll try and keep this brief. I'm going to talk about it in my lecture tomorrow morning as well. Um, but I'll keep it brief because this is a remarkable place. There's old Humboldt Lake area which is now dried up uh, in Nevada. There's also Pyramid Lake. There's you have the Winnemucca petroglyphs up that way, which date back to 14,800 years old. Uh, which I believe were carved by giants. And the Lovelock Cave area is fascinating because there are these legends and stories that were put out in a book actually by Sarah Winnemucca Hopkins, who was the daughter of a chief of the area in the late 1800s. Oh, she wrote about these, these terrifying red-haired cannibals of the Saiti Car, uh, which means tulip eaters. And, and everyone thought, oh, this can't be real, there's these sort of tall, bare-skinned, red-haired people terrorizing this native population of Paiutes. And it was believed to be just a mere story. But then, in 19, I believe 1904, the first evidence of them emerged where an 11, uh, over 11 foot skeleton was said to have been unearthed and reported in a newspaper, a local newspaper at the time. And then in 1911 and 12, they were digging into the Lovelock Cave and they, they were digging on this guano, this sort of bat that they used for fertilizer and so forth. And they kept finding all these artifacts and mummified remains of these red-haired people. Some of them were between six and eight feet tall. And this, this actually caused a sensation. We tracked all the newspaper stories near my uh, co-author, Jim B. Aaron. Mm. I found this is a reality. And there's even a story, just to put it in perspective, that the local fraternal lodge took one of the giant mummies took it to their lodge, boiled it so all the skin and mummified remains would be off it, and used their skeleton in ritual, um, which is nice, but <laughs> not a good thing to do if you don't, you don't mess with the, the, the burials of the giants. Uh, and so, so this is no, the tip of the iceberg of this, so there's much more, there's more discoveries were made in the 1960s. But what's intriguing is that they were mummified, and so there was actually mummification processes going on. They did have red hair, it matched the stories of the traditions. Of the, she even had a piece of red hair in one of her dresses she wore when she gave public lectures. And so there's a reality to this. So sometimes, uh, as John said, the, the, in some places the, the hair does turn red naturally all the time in these kind of burials and certain conditions. But in the case of these giants, uh, not so much. And the story goes that they, the Paiutes, actually, this is what Sarah Winnemite and Hopkins wrote, that they, they had to get all the giants, gather them, and push them into a cave and actually burn them out and kill them all. And this is the cave where they actually found the remains. 
Have you, have you seen that sarcophagus in the Cairo Museum that's next to the Schist disc? It's worth like 10 feet, the sarcophagus. I mean, we were there back in February, March with a kid who's 6'4". He lays down the side of this on the floor. We take a picture of him. He looks like a child compared to the sarcophagus. He's just sitting there in the middle of the Cairo Museum uh, on the second floor. And there's a whole bunch of those. I've seen some in the British Museum as well. And you know, we've done some research into the old photos of Egypt. And there's many more. And they're not as like, clearly ancient basketball players. <laughs> 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 That's right. The AMBA. That's right. Um, but the thing is, is that giants is very important because they're not. They were wiped out by God according to the Book of Genesis, the, the Essene text about the Watchers that they're total and only the cause of the, the previous flood uh, that wiped out human civilization. They, they're the offspring of the Anunnaki, the, the, the sons of God who came down and mated with the daughters of men. They're, they're the offspring of this, this hybrid race and they were running rampant in the ancient world. And we have to remember that this is the reason why God sent the flood. This is the justification for the flood in the book of Genesis and the Essene text is to eliminate this race of beings from the face of the earth. But they existed. They, they, they they were able to survive the flood. And one of my favorite stories, uh, which I'm sure you're aware of, is in the uh, Book of Numbers. Moses and the Israelites are headed for the Promised Land. Moses uh, is instructed by God to send out two spies from each of the 12 tribes. Joshua and Caleb go uh, into the Valley of Eshcol, which means the Valley of Red Cluster, Red. as in grapes. And they find this, uh, the, the sons of Anak still dwell there. These are the giants. So, Joshua and Caleb, and Joshua is Moses' hand-picked successor. He's, he knows what he's doing. And Moses has trained all the wisdom of the Egyptians. He's not just some military commander. This guy knows what's going on. And they go into Eshcol, and they steal this oversized cluster of grapes from the Anunnaki, from the giants, and they carry it back. They're so large, it takes Joshua and Caleb and maybe some other people to carry them back to Moses. And they tell Moses, we're not going anywhere near Eshcol because one, the sons of Anak dwell there, the city is well fortified, and they're giants. And so Moses is clearly warned. And the thing is, is that that cluster of grapes, you would think the Bible would make a big deal out of this. Like, hey, we just stole something of immense significance, the grapes of the promised land. They're called. We stole these from the Anunnaki. Do you think the, you know, the, the authors of the Gen book of Genesis would say, yeah, Moses took those and he stashed them in the Ark of the Covenant and put them in another dimension or something? The Bible drops the subject cold. But what's really interesting about this is that in the esoteric Christian tradition, those two thieves show up in a very important event, the crucifixion of Jesus. You see the grapes of the Anunnaki brought on a large pole by Joshua and Caleb to the crucifixion. They are identified as Joshua and Caleb, and the mystical Christians say that these two events are concurrent, that the crucifixion of Jesus had something to do with this cluster of grapes stolen from the Anunnaki by Joshua and Caleb, and that they are brought to the crucifixion. The one thing that I didn't mention about the Book of Numbers story that's really key, at least in my research, is that Joshua makes a very cryptic uh, report to Moses. He says that the land there, the promised land, eateth the people up. And you go to your Bible commentators and it says, well, uh, it must be that the land didn't provide enough food. But that's belied by the fact that we're in the promised land, the land of milk and honey. And they make other excuses for, for why the, the land consumed the people. But the way I look at it, knowing that the Anunnaki could well have been Stargate travelers, is that Joshua and Caleb are watching people walk along the surface of the earth at the Zanahaki compound, and they vanish as if they went through a portal. That's what I think happened. That's why that, that cluster of grapes was brought to the crucifixion, because these depictions that show Joshua and Caleb with the cluster of the grapes at the crucifixion also show this immense portal of light behind Jesus on the cross, tying these, these events and the possibility of a portal uh, to the crucifixion. I want to pick up on a couple of things there, from a very different angle altogether. The um, description of other races, previous belief systems, previous cultures as giants and as cannibals uh, can be uh, propaganda. As a new system comes in and they are trying to get people to believe in this religion and to follow this leader, and they say, oh, the old leader, uh, monsters, they, they eat children. Uh, they, they're, 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 they're 
a whole bunch that don't, don't trust anything they say. And, and now when this new civilization succeeds, it gets a hold of the history books. They keep embellishing it because cannibalism was an honorable tradition. People really did eat people for good reasons. Uh, not just to survive. In fact, it was ritual. It wasn't about survival. In fact, we play plenty food around. It's because it was believed that the people contained a certain magic unique to that culture. And we want our own magic called mana. And we want our competitors' magic, so we will eat them. Usually it was token. It wasn't like eat a lot of people. The, uh, a, 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 a leader or a general or a warrior was sacrificed and everybody got in on the mana. And then later it was demonized. It, it doesn't compete. These two different readings don't really clash with each other with different dimensions. And, and also, Jonathan, something that is interesting philosophically is um, when you look in the Bible and the tradition of the Watchers and the Philom, the idea that um, humans not only were hybridized with you know, giants, but it's also a way of showing that I guess we're close to God, we touch God, God's bigger than us. It, it, because it's a metaphor to say we're made in God's image, but if there is actual reproduction of divine or semi-divine creatures, depending on how we see the people in them, then we are actual gods. We are actually of the long line, the genetic heritage of the descendant. I'm a mythologist, so I tend to think it's a rich story about the psychological meaning, but you could take it all liter literally if you wanted to. Right, yeah, and that's where the ancient astronaut theory comes in, and it's the idea that, um, you know, people try to connect the story of giants to missing link and notions like that, you know, meaning that, that maybe that's part of why we're here is because we're somehow offshoots of a giant race. Yeah, and then when you, if you go, going back to this idea that if the giants, the mighty ones, possess this transmittable cloak or garment that gave them superpowers, maybe there's something within our DNA that we're trying to reclaim those superpowers. And this is exactly what's happening today with the merger of, of technology and the human body is that we're literally creating a new exoskeleton for ourselves, a new skin that we're going to be merging with AI. And to me, that's just a direct reflection of what the Anunnaki brought here. Here's our power flow. If you put this on, you're going to be a giant just like we are. And so this is the promise now of Silicon Valley and MIT is working on this, of course, for the U.S. military that we'll be able to merge ourselves with this, with this technology and gain these superpowers that include invisibility, levitation, ability to leap over tall buildings and do all the things that the ancient gods could do for, for mimicking what the giants did uh, with our technology. And it could be that you know this is a, a ring past not, that we're, we're not to merge ourselves with technology. We could be at this very moment where we're looking at a, maybe some kind of a, another cataclysmic event that will prevent us from this ultimate merger, which we won't be able to turn back from. You know, something else that Hugh had touched on earlier um, is uh, megalithic evidence, uh, not just in the structures themselves, like, like a big structure, but uh, structures that specifically suggest or intended to either house a giant, such as a tomb, or I'm even thinking of Easter Island, uh, the Moai, and, and the, the depictions of large bases and the traditions that these were uh, based upon giant people that they had witnessed. We in Easter Island, one of the first Dutch explorers to actually visit the island claimed that they witnessed giants alive just a few hundred years ago. When they came up to their waist, they could almost walk underneath their legs. Uh, and so there are genuine kind of what appear to be factual accounts of people even living relatively recent times. Um, and yet these structures we find around the world in Easter Island, I think one of the most interesting ones is what we featured in the, the island of the giants show about ancient Sardinia. There are 750 of these giant graves, tombs, like megalithic tombs around the country. If you look at them from above, they look like a bull's head, a representation of a bull's head with a curved wall court and a back end tomb chamber with massive megalithic blocks. Many of them are like 20 feet long, the largest one is 30 feet. And we have some accounts, we have many legends, but we actually have actual accounts from 1901 of a nine-foot skeleton being found in one of these. We have uh, two over eight-foot giants were discovered in two more in 1953. These are proper newspaper like, reported accounts of discoveries that were being made at the time. And so this has actually made people realize these aren't just giant tombs because they just believe they're so big they must have been built by giants. Actual skeletal remains have been reported from over 100 years ago on the island. 
Um, and this road is pretty much everywhere. I mean, you, you look at these cyclopean walls, these megalithic walls around the planet. Sassé Romain, we spoke about that uh, in a previous uh, panel. Even the sites in Italy and Greece are remarkable. And so people just assume they're built with giants. But actually, you look into the legends and the, the construction process. I mean, even the sites in Greece, the, um, the, you know, the leaders at that time, during the time of the Olympians, were said to have employed the cyclops to build the structures. And that's just a fact over there. You know, they employ the giants to do the hard labor. So there's, there's too much evidence around the world. There's too many skeletal discoveries deep hidden in the records to suggest it's all just, you know, in our imagination, or it's all just legend. Going to legend, the um, reverence for the ancient builders and ancient metallurgists, this was essentially magic. When it became industry, and we had an industrial revolution long later, but uh, if you could make a sword in the Bronze Age that had a little tin at the edge or something, if you, if you could create that, you could win battles. So the reverence for the person who could do this were very rare. And the, the legend of a sword coming out of the stone, well, that's that metal coming out of mineral. And the one who could do that was often banished to the forts. And, get, and then stories which would come up about great wizards and people, magical powers, and people that could build good walls, particularly fortifications, but also monuments. Well, these were amazing skills. Now we can we can crunch the numbers in the computer, but they were done very, very well back in the day. So the idea of a giant or a magical person who had some secret, and the, the part about the forest is to protect them. This was the nuclear secret of the time. So you didn't want the other army to get your metallurgist or your stonemason. And the um, secret orders, like the Masons, pay some homage to that ancient tradition of spiritual magic being contained in the ability to fabricate. Interesting. Yeah, and, and you know, part of the belief system about uh, uh, giants from the past that you're talking about the reverence and so forth, it's interesting how uh, nowadays uh, there's almost the reverse uh, attitude. In other words, the idea that there couldn't have been anything in the past other than the way we are pretty much precisely now. That there was no uh, prior version of humanity, and, and you know, even everything you say to you about all the, the, the bones that have been found in all the reports. Um, I know that you've spoken before about not necessarily a cover-up, but certainly a dismissal and a refusal to look at uh, uh, some of these things. And maybe that's why a lot of these bones get lost and they get reported and then no, no one knows what happens to them. Yes, it's not a cover-up. It's a massive conspiracy. <laughs> <Yes>. So, <laughs> now it's, um, this is something we, we write about. Um, we have a couple of GPL. We can go into this, especially in North America. Quite disturbing. Actually. It's quite a disturbing story. But, um, the, the Smithsonian, the early Smithsonian, back in the 1800s, they found hundreds. Well, they found tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of skeletons buried around caves, buried deep, and they were building the foundations for houses and so forth, all across North America. And this, this is, you know, very early stories going back to the 16, 1700s when the people were first coming here. Um, and the problem is, when the Smithsonian was founded, um, they were championing the idea of evolution. There was also this problem of uh, manifest destiny, this idea that, you know, we come to this land and everyone else is a savage, we're going to remove them from the land, put them on reservation, which is a very disturbing, very racist idea. But this was championed, this was pushed forward. So when they kept finding skeletons that were 12 foot tall, 36 inch circumference skulls, within these massive astronomically aligned geometric earthworks, it didn't really fit their ideas of evolution and manifest destiny, so they kind of brushed it under the carpet and put it to one side like it didn't exist. But more and more got discovered, and they kept being discovered. In fact, the Smithsonian employed hundreds of people to travel around America to collect skeletons and skulls. Uh, for examination, and they, they kept finding these giants. And we, we've collected over 1,200 accounts in North America of these seven to 18 foot tall giants being discovered. In the Smithsonian's own annual reports from uh, the late 1800s, specifically the fifth and the twelfth annual report, there's 17 accounts of seven to eight foot tall skeletons being unearthed in their own reports. And then they deny it afterwards. We bought them original reports for the 1800s. It cost us a lot of money, and they're in there. And 
this absolutely blows my mind. Then he started looking through all the academic records, the Maryland, uh, Maryland Academy of Sciences, uh, Yale as well. They were digging up these skeletons. It's all there. There is a reality to this. And there is a big cover-up. And the thing that gets me about these giants, which William talked about, is that mostly they were kind of an elite, especially with the Melbourne, because they were an elite state of the open, they had their own little villages that they lived in and worked in, and they bred only with other elites from different tribes, different areas. And this is how they maintained their, not only their genetic height and status, but also um, their learning and wisdom and teachings were passed on. And this is high-level magic and sorcery that they were working with. And this, this passed on through many, many different cultures, not just in North America. Yeah, that to me is what is so alluring about the story of the giants is recognizing, yeah, we're, we're talking about these very tall people, but they're hybrids. They are, they are the offspring of extraterrestrials and, and humans. And there was a, a, a force and authority on this planet that decided these people could no longer exist. And there was a concerted effort worldwide to just fully erase evidence their existence, and yet North America seems to have been uh, one of their major population centers, based on all of these reports and the remains that we're finding um, in these various accounts of Greg's, Greg's research and others. An incredible story. I really want to agree with this idea of uh, looking down, condescending toward the past, this idea that we have the best ideas, we've made a lot of progress, this is an arrogance that people before us might have had magic or just intelligence, skills that were lost. They were lost through conspiracy, through war, through disaster, various ways. And our, our ideas are not always the best, and in fact, in intellectual history, often there's a rediscovery of something that either has been intentionally or just lost track of, or lost reputation. For some reason, uh, through the competition of ideas, it gets discounted, then a, a later generation has to retrieve it, with, with something of value has been mis misplaced. And I think something that's interesting, um, especially uh, you when you talk about, oh, uh, perhaps there's a mass conspiracy. But on the same hand, uh, what Jonathan just said is possible too. That sometimes things are lost or misrecognized or not appreciated for what they are. And um, what I think of is uh, Brian Forrester's research with the elongated skulls. In other words, uh, we're familiar all with head binding and that you can, you know, elongate a skull of an infant. But his research suggests that in some cases, these skulls are actually just that was their genetic makeup. And, that and so we, maybe we're seeing a giant skull, we just don't recognize what it is. I have a question for you. You know Giorgio pretty well. Does he tease up his hair to hide the elongated skull? No. Is there a lung up? They're hiding in plain sight. And we don't recognize what they are. We never know. They called them the big G in the last year. Yeah. <laughs> no, but I, I think that, you know, it, it provided that that research is correct and that whoever these individuals were were born with large heads like that, it stands the reason the rest of their bodies have been large. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, I know Brian I mean, for many years, and I've, I've seen a lot of these skulls, and they are weird. Very, very weird. And it's not just in South America, it's everywhere. In North America, there's actually, we've got evidence uh, of actual elongated skulls, giant elongated skulls that have been found in North America. We have accounts, we even have reports of uh, people, you know, breaking into graveyards and stealing them from a burial ground and bringing them back to America from Canada and Alaska and places. It's pretty weird. But can you get these elongated skulls going back over 7,000 years to Iraq, which is intriguing, in the, to the, the Greb Mountains? That area, and there's a photograph and a report that came out uh, which is put proper data on all the artifacts found nearby and data to that era, which is, you know, what's going on here. You know, is this someone elongating the skull or is this a genetic thing going on here? And, you know, as Brian, as we mentioned with Brian, he's found um, almost like babies that have got elongated skulls, even, even fetuses and things like this, which is utterly bizarre. So there is some kind of genetic trait not only with the elongated skull people, but with these, these giantism as well. And we're not talking about acromegaly or gigantism, um, you know, pituitary gland, you know, misalignment where you just grow exponentially like Robert Wadlow. These ancient giants, there's been not any accounts of that. And there's, they've only found one example in North America out of 1,500 or so accounts that we have here. 
so there's certainly some genetic things going on which are causing, causing problems for academics. Another one of the things I just want to mention is double rows of teeth. Mm -hmm. We have something like 100 accounts, maybe 80 accounts of double rows of teeth found in these giant skulls that would be in the map. Even in the Smithsonian report, reports from the late 1800s, we have one with triple rows of teeth from Amelia Island in Florida. So we know this is another strange genetic throwback which could be related to uh, the Neanderthals, it could even be related to the Denisovans, who uh, we should probably have a little chat about, because th these are thought now to be giants, new, strange human beings found in Siberia, in the Altai uh, mountain range in southern Siberia. And these go back 40,000 to 200,000 years old. And the problem is, uh, a lot of people, a lot of academics find things, that North American, Native American, um, have Denisovan DNA, so we are directly connected. These giants found in North America are from the giants of Siberia. There's been a, a, a thumb bow, a finger bow, teeth, and now a skull fragment, which are much larger than average human beings. And so the fact is we've got this whole new giant race emerging on Earth, and that's not the only one, there are more. Yeah, and so then if we have this evidence of the existence of the giants, then that's just a small step away from proving this original story that the giants are the offspring of extraterrestrials and human females. That's the problem. That's another reason why we have to eliminate evidence of, of giants and just stop talking about them because they're a direct link then to extraterrestrials. You got enough? Great, great. So we have a little time to do some questions. Um, if you all want to come to the front here uh, and form a line. Well, you're learning. I'm a 